Christ the sure and steady anchor in the fury of the storm. When the winds of doubt blow through me and my sails have all been torn. In the suffering, in the sorrow, when my sinking hopes are few.
grace of God has reached for me and pulled me from the raging sea and I am safe on the solid ground the Lord is my salvation I will not fear when dark scale these walls I'll see the dawn of the rising sun the Lord is my salvation the 
satisfied He is all that I need May it become what may That I rest all my days In the goodness of Jesus Find what this world cannot offer Come and find your joy here complete Taste the living water, never thirst again Rest here in His wondrous peace Oh, the goodness, the goodness of Jesus Satisfied, He is all that I need May it become what may That I rest all my days In the goodness of Jesus Find your hope now in Jesus He is all He said He would be Grace is overflowing from the Savior's heart Rest here in His wondrous peace Oh, the goodness, the goodness of Jesus Satisfied, He is all that I need May it become what may That I rest all my days In the goodness of Jesus Oh, the goodness, the goodness of Jesus Satisfied he is all that I need May it become what may That I rest all my days In the goodness of Jesus May it become what may That I rest all my days in the goodness of Jesus Good morning and welcome to Hebron Online. A special welcome to you if you are visiting with us this morning. If uh, this is one of your first times logging on to uh, worship with us, we're glad that you're here. And we hope that, um, yeah, you can uh, join us in lifting up the name of our God here together this morning. And so our God calls us to worship him through the words of Psalm 86. So I invite you to join me as we hear our God call us to worship him this morning. There is none like you, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and bow down before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God and worthy of all our praise. You, O God, are holy. And so please join me as we sing the words of holy is our God. In a, but just before we, uh, before we sing this, we're going to sing these words of verse 1. Lift up his name within the sanctuary. Lift up his name among the people who are gathered here to sing his praise. And so even as we are gathered together online, this is a, choosing to sing this song is a, a true statement about what we believe the church is, about how the church meets and gathers and worships together. Um, we are, we are the church. We are the body of Christ. Um, we're not dependent on a building of brick and stone um, if we still want to be united in worshiping our God. So as he's called us together this morning, I invite you to join me as we worship together as his body.
Holy is our God. Let's sing. Lift up his name within the sanctuary. Lift up his name among the people who are gathered here to sing his praise. Who are gathered here to sing his praise. Holy is our God. Holy is your name. Mighty are your God has called us to worship him this morning, he also welcomes us into this place. And he greets us with these words. He says, grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In this greeting, I invite you to join us as we continue to lift up the name of our God together here this morning. Come and stand amazed, you people. Come and stand amazed, you people. See how God is reconciled. See his plans of love accomplished. See his gift, this newborn child. See the mighty, weak, and tender. See the word who now is mute. See the sovereign without splendor. The fool is destitute. See how. 
how humankind received him See him wrapped in swaddling bands Who is Lord of all creation Rules the wind by his commands See him lying in a manger With that sign of reasoning Word of God to flesh God incarnate who assumed this humble form counsel me and let my wishes to your perfect will conform light of life dispel my darkness let your frailty strengthen me let your meekness give me boldness let your burden set me But 
the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hear now this call to confession from Psalm 32. The psalmist testifies, Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. While I kept silent, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you. And I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. So I invite you to join us in this song of confession. My Jesus, I love thee. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign my gracious Redeemer my Savior art thou if ever I love thee my Jesus tis now I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. Hear the good news. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So be at peace. Your sin is forgiven. In mansions of glory and endless delight, I
Amen. Well, it's at this time that we have the opportunity to come to God's Word and to read a section of it and to see how he's, or hear how he's speaking into our lives. And so this morning, I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Ruth chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 6 to 18 of Ruth chapter 1. And as we do every week, let's uh, invite God to speak to us through his Word. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and Redeemer. We pray that you would illuminate your word to us this morning, that you would shine light upon it, that we can uh, see it clearly, that we can grasp and understand what it is you're saying to us. If there are things in our lives, God, that you don't want to be there, we pray that you would uproot them at this time. But if there's things that you want to be there, uh, plant them, grow them, prune them, bring them to fruition in our lives. We pray also at this time, God, that um, only your voice may speak and that you would silence all of the other voices in our lives, whether they be of our own flesh, the world around us, or the devil and the demonic. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Ruth chapter 1, verses 6 to 18. And it's there that we read these words. When she, that is Naomi, heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living, and she set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness to you as you have shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud, and and they said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. At this, they wept again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, do not urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates me and you. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And they exclaimed, can this be Naomi? This is God's word. Thanks be to God for it. Now, I find it interesting that in the Jewish scripture, Ruth was placed among the wisdom literature. Not because it's not full of wisdom, but because of the package that this wisdom comes in. We're not sure the exact dating of Ruth, but they mention David in the text, and so it means it has to be written sometime after 1000 BC. Now, we may not know much off the top of our heads about that time period, but one thing that the Bible often receives much flack for, especially in our day and age, is its seemingly regressive view of women. We read stories about how certain women were treated in the Bible, and we make the assumption that because it's in Scripture, the Bible is condoning it. But not all behavior in the Bible is meant to be duplicated. Some things are present just to show us the depravity of the human condition. Or we read some of the Old Testament laws, and we read them through the lens of our modern culture, and we think that they're regressive. But if we read them against the backdrop of the ancient Near Eastern culture at the time, we would see how much they actually elevate the status of women. Perhaps not to the status that we moderns would like it to be, but we need to bear in mind that there is a such thing as progressive revelation in the Bible. Things get clearer as you come into the New Testament. But we also need to bear in mind that just because it rubs our modern mind the wrong way doesn't mean that the Bible's view is is wrong, but maybe our own view needs refinement. But I think one of the clearest indicators of the elevated status of women in Scripture is right here in the book of Ruth. An entire book written in 1000 BC in which the hero of the story is a woman, a foreign woman at that. 
Imagine reading through Proverbs, hearing the opening chapters, my son, my son, listen to my teaching, hear the words of my mouth that you might find wisdom. And then that book ends with a concrete example, but it's a concrete example not of a man, of a woman, and then it's followed by the real life depiction of Ruth. I don't think the lesson is just in the morals of the text, but also in the package that it comes in. If you want to learn this wisdom, you don't just need to humble yourself to learn a lesson from somebody else. You need to humble yourself to learn a lesson from somebody you probably considered an outsider, a foreign widow. The name Ruth comes from the Hebrew word that means friendship or companion. And certainly throughout the book, that's exactly what Ruth is to Naomi. But I don't think it's just a message of the special companionship of Ruth. The depth of Ruth's commitment and companionship to Naomi is off the charts, like beyond, beyond special. And there is only one place in scripture that I think it finds its match, God's friendship. This foreign woman is going to teach us some deep lessons about who God is, who we are, and what it is to be in relationship with him. And I imagine the oddity of the whole story would be enough to knock the yarmulke off a young Jewish boy as he's reading through this. Through the lips of foreigners, God will speak to his people, says Isaiah. And that's exactly what God does through Ruth. Ruth is going to show us four things this morning. First, Ruth is going to show us the faithfulness of God. Second, she's going to show us the preciousness of God. Third, she's going to show us the beauty of God. And then fourth, she's going to show us the power of God. One of the lessons for success that we pick up early in life is the use of buzzwords. Whether we're writing an essay or a test for our history professor and we make sure we use words like nationalism or scientific revolution, or if we're in a job interview and we make sure we use words like growth opportunities or acronyms like ROI, KPI, and POV to show that we know what we're talking about. Well, the Bible has some buzzwords in it too, and one of them happens to be found in verse 8 of our text. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. The word behind kindness is the Hebrew word chesed, and it's a word that God often uses of himself when he's referring to his covenant faithfulness. So, for example, when God proclaims his name to Moses in Exodus chapter 34, it reads like this, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in loyal love and trustworthiness, maintaining loyal love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Now, one study note on this particular verse says this, These two words, loyal love and trustworthiness, are often found together, occasionally in a hendiandus construction. If that is the interpretation here, then it means faithful covenant love. Even if they are left separate, they are dual elements of a single quality. The first word is God's faithful covenant love. The second word is God's reliability and his faithfulness. Now, the narrator in our text almost drops this word like a subtitle indicating what's about to take place next. Naomi says, may the Lord show you chesed as you have shown chesed to me, specifically drawing a comparison of Ruth and Orpah's love for her to God's loyal love. But is Ruth and Orpah's commitment to Naomi really an equivalent comparison to God's loyal love? If Naomi thinks that this is a comparison to God's chesed, uh, that they just stick by her when trouble comes, she is just yet scratching the surface of what God's loyal love actually looks like. And now we need to give Orpah credit here because often we uphold Ruth as uh, an example of loyalty and then as a result we vilify Orpah. And I'll admit that that's what I was going to do when I first came to this text, but I think that it misses the point. You see, Orpah is loyal. She is incredibly loyal. She is willing to leave her family. She's willing to leave her people. She's willing to leave her land to follow Naomi into Judah. Even when Naomi initially urges her to turn back, Orpah refuses. It's not until Naomi demands that she leave that Orpah actually turns around and leaves her. And this dialogue between Naomi and Orpah uh, reminds me of a bunch of scenes that I've seen in movies or television shows where the main character is so uh, scared for the person that they love that they drive them away to keep them safe or in an effort to keep them safe. The main character loves the girl, for instance, but he's concerned for her safety 
if she continues to hang around with him. And so at first he urges her to leave him. Uh, you know, it's not safe for you. Go away. It's not good for us to be together. But after the girl refuses and she says, no, I'm staying with you. I'm staying with you. He finally tries a different tactic and he turns on her. He says that he doesn't love her. He says that he doesn't want to be with her, that it was just a fling. Um, and he makes the girl hate him in order that she will leave him behind. But really deep down inside, he actually loves her. He just doesn't want to see her get hurt. And I think this is a little bit about what's happening here between Orpah and Naomi. Orpah's bags are packed and she's already on the road with Naomi. She is probably more loyal than you or I would be in this situation. Even after Naomi urges her to go home once, she refuses. But then Naomi turns on her and three times she tells her to go home. Turn back. There's no life to be had with me. Turn back. If you come with me, you're going to be widowed. You're going to be destitute. And you're going to be impoverished. Turn back and go home because God is against me. And I cannot, uh, you're going to increase my pain if I watch you suffer as well. And it's not until Naomi says to Orpah that she is going to cause her more pain if she hangs around than she, that she actually turns around and leaves. And so I think Orpah is exceedingly loyal and that's the point. How do you highlight something's greatness? You don't compare it to poor examples, you compare it to great examples. If a diamond stands out amongst a bunch of lumps of coal, you don't really mean, it doesn't really mean it's a special diamond. But if it shines even amongst other diamonds, then you know you have something special, something truly great. Orpah is amazingly loyal, but Ruth is over the top, obnoxiously loyal, even when Naomi tries to drive her away, even when Naomi turns and says all kinds of mean things to her to try and get her to leave her alone and abandon her. In Ruth chapter 1, verse 14 and 17, then it says the result. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, do not urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. That word that uh, Ruth uses, uh, but Ruth clung to her is the same word used as cleaving between a husband and a wife. It's the strongest, uh, or it symbolizes the strongest love that we know between two human people. No matter what Naomi does to her, Ruth will not let her go. To the point that she says, I am going to be buried right beside you in death, still holding you tight. You want a comparison of what God's steadfast chesed looks like? That's the picture. God is obnoxiously committed to us. He cannot forsake you. He cannot leave his side. You may kick him. You may yell and scream at him. You may demand that he leave you alone and try and drive him from your side just as Naomi did Ruth, but he will not forsake you. He will not let you go because to forsake you would mean to forsake himself. And for us who live on the other side of the cross, this is not just an abstract picture or an abstract promise for us. It meets its concrete reality in Jesus Christ. We urged him to leave. We yelled at him. We screamed at him. We beat him with rods and we crucified him. And yet he took it all and he refused to let us go. He stayed right there by our side. We cannot drive away his love. What a beautiful picture Ruth gives of us still clinging to Naomi as she's being buried into the grave. And we know that that's not just hyperbole in Jesus. As we lay, are laid in the casket, Jesus says, wherever you go, I will go, even if it be down to the grave. And if you're going to bury them, you have to bury me as well, because I will not let them go. And that's exactly what he does. He goes down to the grave, refusing to let go of us in death but also then refusing to let go of us in resurrection life. If we die with him, we will also live with him. And that's the picture of a faithful God that Ruth shows us. The second thing Ruth shows us is the preciousness of God. Naomi is bitter with God because of all of her loss. She wishes that God would just leave her alone because he has taken from her husbands and two sons. She is far from her homeland and far from her people. Naomi even left uh, God during the famine in an effort to keep her husband and to keep her sons. But look at what Ruth is willing to give up just to get God. 
Ruth is willing to forsake uh, leaving or having a husband. She's willing to forgo having children of her own. She's willing to leave behind her home, her people, her language, her culture, and adopt a new people and a new God. We need to hear this because <clears throat> Naomi is like many of us Christians who have been Christians for a really, really long time. Often we gripe about all the things that we've had to give up because of God's sake. Or we try and keep our feet Uh, firmly planted in both worlds, refusing to give up certain habits or customs from our old way of life. We attend church, but by no means are these people going to be my people. They're just my Sunday companions and nothing more. Or our girlfriend or our boyfriend isn't really that interested in God or church. And so we, like Naomi, forsake God to keep our new bay. And thankfully, God sometimes sends new Christians or a foreigner into our mix to wake us up to the preciousness of what it is that we actually have. They willingly give up home, land, culture. Often it means saying goodbye to mom and to dad because they now disown them. And yet, they willingly give it up just to have God. And here we live scheming with how we can keep our feet in both worlds and live both our old life and our new life at the same time. Nabil Qureshi grew up as a Muslim for most of his life, and he wrote the book, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. He describes a moment wrestling with God on the mosque floor where he prays this prayer. Please, God Almighty, tell me who you are. I beseech you and only you. Only you can rescue me. At your feet, I lay down everything I have learned, and I give my entire life to you. Take away what you will, be it my joy, my friends, my family, or even my life. But let me have you, O God. Light the path that I must walk. I don't care how many hurdles are in the way, how many pits I must jump over or climb out of, or how many thorns I must step through. Just show me which path is yours, dear God, so that I can walk it. Do we grasp the weight of the preciousness of what it is that we hold? Would we be willing to pray that prayer to receive what it is that we hold and often take for granted? Yes, Naomi has suffered much in her life, and many of us would be sorrowful and bitter in her shoes. But Ruth's words remind her and us not to forsake the most precious thing that she has in the midst of everything going on. Sometimes in our grief, we forget how precious it is to be a covenant child of God to whom belong the promises of a God such as Yahweh. We have lived with these promises so long that they become old hat to us, and our hearts have become fat callous to their precious net of their weight. And it takes the mouth of a foreigner, somebody new to the faith, someone who knows what it's like to travel through sorrow and pain without such a rich resource to wake up our eyes to the preciousness of what it is that we actually hold. And so Ruth shows us the preciousness of God. Third, Ruth shows us in this passage the beauty of God. Look at the name of God that Ruth uses in the oath that she takes with Naomi. She says, may the Lord or may Yahweh deal with me ever so severely if anything but death separates us. Ruth uses the covenant name for God when she speaks to Naomi. And this shows us the beauty of God. You see, God's purpose in bringing Israel into the promised land was not just for their own sakes. But God was to bless them so that they in turn would bless the other nations around them. The beauty of their relationship with God was supposed to stir up the jealousy of the nations around them. That they would see Israel's God and they would see Israel's relationship with this God. And they would long to have a God that is so close to them as Yahweh is close to Israel. Listen to the words of Deuteronomy 4. See, I have taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me, so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to take possession of it. Observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations, who will hear about it, all these decrees, and say, Surely this is... This great nation is a wise and an understanding people. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? And what other nation is so great as to have such a righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws that I'm setting before you today? Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. 
But God's people do forget the things they have seen and let them fade from their heart, especially this family in our text. They do not follow the decrees and they do not adhere to God's law. They do not remember the goodness of having a God who is so close to them whenever they call upon him. But instead, they forsake him for the gods of other nations. But despite the brokenness of this family, despite the shattered dream of what they were supposed to look like, somewhere along the lines, Ruth catches a glimpse of the beauty of God. Somehow, some way, even in their incredibly corrupted and dysfunctional state, Israel and this family have somehow managed to shine as a light to the nations and this foreigner wants in. And this is good news for us. It's not an excuse, but it's good news. Because we, the church, like Israel, were placed in a land to give a glimpse to the nations around us of what it's like to live with a God who is so close and truth that is so righteous that they are to want in. But more often than not, we give a broken picture instead of a beautiful portrait. We run after other gods and we squabble amongst ourselves. And so not just taint our beauty, but also taint God's beauty by it. But yet somehow, even in our utter dysfunction, the beauty of God still finds a way to shine forth. Somehow the light still rises above us and nations come running to the light and kings to the brightness of God's dawning. Even when broken, Ruth still sees the beauty of God compared to her old Moabite gods and she wants a God who is so close for herself. She is a Moabite by skin only because everything else about her identity is shed away. She takes the covenant name of God upon her lips and with it a new identity as a covenant child of God. Do we see the beauty of God? It is not just that he asks us to surrender our old identity makers or the markers that set ourselves apart as special, but the fact that our new identity is so much better and more beautiful than our old one is. Do we see the darkness of our old way of life where we found our identity in our job or in our career or in our role as a father or our abilities? Do we see the fragility of of that kind of thing? Or do we look back and do we remember what it's like to just be on that treadmill, constantly trying to prove our worth through these objects to ourselves and to other people? Things that never delivered on, on on their promises and didn't come to our aid when we needed help. And do we see, as Ruth did, the beauty of living with a God who is so close that whenever we call upon him, he comes to our aid. And we know that Uh, God is far closer to us than Ruth ever knew. Um, Jesus came and he dwelt among his people, but he left, but not in abandonment. He left because it was going to be better for us. He gave us the Holy Spirit who could be with God's people, not just a few people at a time because in space, but rather he could be with God's children wherever they are. Do we see the beauty of having a God so close as that? And do we live into that beauty so that the people around us are jealous and they want a God who is also so close to them, not just in times of trouble, but also in good times? Ruth shows us the beauty of God. Fourth, Ruth shows us the power of God. Is Ruth being stupid? Is her oath to Naomi just reckless abandoned? Ah, an ah, screw it. If we're going to go down in flames, we might as well go together. Does Ruth think this is a suicide mission, but at this point she just doesn't care because she's lost everything else? I don't think so. Ruth knows the power of God. Ruth, the text says that Ruth clung to Naomi and refused to let her go. That word clung, that word cleave, is the same word that's used throughout Deuteronomy of how God's people are meant to cling to him. Remember the text that I read you last week from Deuteronomy 10 about God being the great gods, the God among gods, who set his affection upon Israel, even in their destitute state, so that in turn, Israel was supposed to take care of those who were destitute among them. Well, that text continues with these words, fear the Lord your God and serve him, cling to him and take your oaths in his name. Interesting that Ruth has both clung and she has both taken an oath in Yahweh's name. But then why does Deuteronomy tell us that we are supposed to cling and take oaths in God's name? He is the one you are to praise. He is your God who performed for you the great and the awesome wonders that you saw with your own eyes. Your ancestors who went down into Egypt were 70 in all. And now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars in the sky. The reason 
you're to take your oaths in God's name only and cling to him is because there's nobody that is as powerful as him. There's nobody like him. He is utterly set apart. Your ancestors, when they went down into Egypt, were 70 in all, and God made them as numerous as the stars in the sky. In oppression, in slavery, God still multiplied his people. Ruth is not on a suicide mission. She doesn't know what's going to happen to her and Naomi, but it's not a suicide mission. Ruth knows about the power of God. She is a Moabite, yes, but the reason that Moab refused to give bread to Israel is because they were afraid of Israel. They had heard how God had dried up the waters of the Red Sea um, when they had come out of Egypt. They had heard that God had used this to this functional group of slaves to bring a millennia-old superpower to its knees. They had heard what God did through Israel to the mighty kings of the plains, Sihon and Og. And like Rahab before her with the spies, Ruth has heard as the great and the awesome mighty deeds of the Lord. This is not reckless abandon or blind faith for Ruth. This is calculated and reasoned response. Their situation is bleak, but Ruth knows that there is only one God with the kind of strength and power to work the miracle that these two ladies stand in need of. But how does Ruth know this? She listens. You see, there is one more biblical buzzword that we haven't looked at, and it's right at the start of our text in verse 6. We're going to read it in the ESV because it comes out a little bit clearer. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. Visited is the Exodus word. It is the word that God says to Moses at the burning bush when he takes notice of Israel's, his people's cries and their afflictions and their groanings under the weight of slavery. It signals that God is going to visit his people. He is going to liberate them and bring judgment upon their enemies. And Ruth hears that God is visiting his people once again. And she knows that the God who dried up the Red Sea and the God of the Ten Plagues is on the move once again to work wonders for his people. Whenever God visits his people, it means either liberation and salvation for his people or judgment upon and retribution on their enemies. And Ruth wants salvation. And we should know what that word signals better than Ruth because we have God's ultimate visiting of his people when he came in Jesus Christ. When God visited us in Jesus, it was for liberation from the power of sin and death, the slavery of sin and death, but it was also for judgment upon sin and rebellion. Only this time, God poured out all of that judgment upon his son, Jesus Christ. But God promises us that he is going to visit again, but not just visit, to dwell forever. And when he visits again, it is going to mean liberation for those, for a broken world, for those who long to be with him, but it's also going to mean judgment for those who don't want anything to do with him. In many ways, we live on the journey. We are on the road with Ruth and Naomi, walking back toward the promised land. We can be with Ruth or we can be like Orpah. We can go forward in faith in the power of God or we can turn back to the old gods and our old culture that we used to serve. We have a choice, turn around or keep walking. And like Ruth, we don't know exactly what we're in for. God doesn't give us an exact picture of how he's going to redeem or, or how he's going to turn around this situation. But we do have his wonders of the past and the power that he worked for his people in the past to give us faith for the future. That this isn't a blind step. This isn't a blind leap. The Red Sea, the cross, the empty tomb all show us the power of God. All show us what God did for his people that he loved. Our choice to keep walking in hope is not reckless abandon, but it's a reasoned response of faith. We have seen the destitution of life. We have seen the fragility of human existence, especially in the time that we live now in the COVID days. And we know that there is only one who has power to redeem even brokenness so great as this. And so Ruth shows us the faithfulness of God's loyal love. She shows us the precious value of having a relationship with a God such as this. She shows us the beauty of having a God who is so close to his people whenever we call on him. And then finally, she shows us the power of God that he can redeem anything. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are. Uh, We thank you, God, that you... Um, are a God of incredible faithfulness, a God of uh, incredible preciousness, um, the weight of 
your value is just too much to measure. Uh, you always tip the scales in your favor. We thank you that you are a God of incredible beauty, that even um, in our fractured state, we only catch glimpses of it, but it's enough to woo us to want you, God. And we thank you, Lord, that you are a God of incredible power. You can redeem any uh, and every single situation. Father, we pray that um, you would grant us faith uh, and grant us a relationship with you like Ruth, um, that though she seemed far away, though she seemed a foreigner, um, you put a mighty faith in her, um, trust in your power, trust in your promises, listening so closely to the word of your text that she could see when you were on the move. Um, God, give us eyes to see that. Give us eyes to see like Ruth. Give us the courage to step forward in faith. Uh, we thank you so much for your, your son, Jesus Christ, who is um, the picture of your faithfulness, the picture of your closeness, the picture of your beauty, and the picture of your power, God, all of those things. Um, we pray that um, you would transform us by those truths. Um, and can you continue to shape us uh, into people after your own heart and your likeness? Help us as we walk on the road, just as Ruth and Naomi did, journeying toward the promised land. Uh, give us faith and give us strength for every single step of the journey. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join me as we respond in singing Ancient of Days.
my joy complete Standing face to face In the presence of the ancient of days None above him, none before him All of time in his hands For his So this time that we have the opportunity to come to God in a time of congregational prayer, um, and as we do uh, every week, we're going to uh, continue to remember a church and a country, um, but we're also going to start a practice of, um, at least during this time, remembering a specific nursing home uh, in our area, and then plus the the needs of our congregation. So we're going to pray for St. Bernadette's Roman Catholic Church in Ajax. We're going to pray for the country of Kyrgyzstan, and then we're also going to pray for Sunny Crest Nursing Home. So please join me in prayer. Our Father who is in heaven, uh, holy is your name. Um, God, you are set apart uh, from all other creatures and all other beings in the universe. Uh, To think, Lord, that um, you hold the world in your hand, but not just the world, the entire universe. Um, We humans can't even get to the edge of it. Uh, We don't possess the ability, and yet uh, you are there. You are boundless by time and space. You created it. You crafted it. Uh, You are a God of incredible transcendence, incredible bigness, um, but you're also a God of incredible um, uh, smallness, incredible particularity, incredible imminence. You dwell with the lowly and the contrite in heart, um, and for that we praise you. God, we pray that your kingdom would come here on earth just as it is in heaven, and your will would be done on earth just as it is in heaven. Uh, Father, we Thank you for the places that we are seeing your will come forth. Um, uh, God, often we are so um, focused in on, on the death and the pain that is going on around us, Lord, that we, we miss um, many of the good things that are going on and many of the recoveries or many of the beautiful things that you've given to us. Um, so, Father, we give you praise for those things, and we thank you that even now you are faithful to us. Even now you are watching over us and holding us um, in the palm of your hands. But, Lord, we do come to you and lament um, in a world that is reeling from so much pain and death and brokenness going around, around us. Uh, every day we hear of hundreds of people um, passing away, and I know that they're just numbers to us, God, but you know them, uh, every single face, intimately. Um, and, Lord, uh, we... We just mourn at the brokenness of the world. We mourn at a world not functioning the way that it should. Uh, And we lament to you and we cry out to you for mercy. Um, Father, we pray that you would bring your kingdom, bring your kingdom into our midst, bring your kingdom into our country, um, bring your kingdom into all of the places where there's brokenness. Um, We need you to go there. Uh, Father, we thank you, Lord, that um, you are on the move and that you are redeeming people and calling people uh, to yourself. We thank you that we have partners uh, in this mission. Um, We think of uh, St. Bernadette's, Lord. Um, We pray that you would continue to uh, give them what they stand in need of, that you would continue to uh, show them the goodness of who you are, the the beauty, the power, the preciousness, and the faithfulness of who you are. Uh, Father, we also pray for the country of Kyrgyzstan. Um, We pray that people would find their hope uh, in uh, in Jesus, and that the the country would have an awakening and a turning to you. Uh, Father, we also want to lift up to you um, some of our nursing homes uh, at this time, God. Often it seems like there are two worlds going on right now. Um, there is the world outside, 
And then there's a world in these homes um, where much of the plague and the pandemic is hitting the hardest. Um, Father, we pray that you would protect our homes, you would protect the workers uh, who are in the homes, that you would grant mercy uh, and grace there for healing and restoration. Um, Father, we lift up to you this, this morning, especially Sunnycrest Nursing Home here in, uh, in Whitby. Uh, we pray that you would be with the residents, with the staff, um, that they would feel your closeness and your comfort. Um, Father, we also want to lift up to you some of the prayers of the people uh, in Hebron, in our congregation. And so we pray that you are with people um, like uh, Roly de Young, and, um, who is awaiting surgery, who has had to put that on pause uh, because of the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, we pray for um, uh, Andrew Mast, as he is in uh, Sunny Crest Nursing Home, for him and Jenny. We pray for uh, John and Hermine Smith. Um, we pray for Hendrick and Dee Dee Prinzen. We're thankful that Hendrick gets to return home, um, but we pray that you would give them strength. Um, we pray for Meta Beanin. We're thankful that you are continuing with her recovery there. Uh, we want to pray for Tony and Nellie Vandermall as they uh, walk through this difficult time as, as uh, Tony is... Um, starting to forget many, many things. And so we pray that you would give them strength. Uh, we pray for Bill and Marie Lundy as Bill continues to battle um, many of uh, the depression or darkness and the mental illness that he is. Uh, we pray for Hank and Pat Neustraten that you would be with them at this time as well. And then we also pray for Jake and Ann Lopers. Um, Father, there are too many needs to name them one by one or to bring their names before you. And there's so many that remain unvoiced, God. Um, we just pray that you would go with them there uh, and be with them in wherever they are. Um, Father, we pray that you would give to them their daily bread. Uh, we pray that you would give to all of us our daily bread. We pray that you would keep us from temptation, from turning our eyes and taking our hope off of you. And we pray that you would deliver us from the evil one. We pray all this in Jesus' name and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For this morning's announcements, you are all welcome to join our online fellowship immediately following the service. This evening at 6.30, we will have our online prayer meeting. Again, everyone is welcome to join. On Wednesday morning, beginning at 9.30, we will have our online coffee break. Wednesday afternoon at 2 o'clock, we'll have our Arabic-English speaking Bible reading. This is a program where Arab, native Arabic speaking people can learn English along with others as they read through the Bible. At 7 p.m., our GEMS will again meet for their GEMS program. Thursday morning at 9 a.m., we have our regularly scheduled prayer meeting. Again, all are welcome to join. Thursday evening at 6.30, we have English at Hebron. All of these programs can be accessed through our website on the events page. Today's offering is for World Renew. There are four ways to give online, our church center mobile app, set up automatic deposit, or simply drop an envelope off at the office. Well, once again, I want to thank you for joining us online and virtually this morning. Um, we hope that you were uh, built up in your faith. We hope that you were encouraged. Uh, we hope that you are continuing to uh, find peace in the presence of God, even in the midst of whatever situation you're in. Uh, if you're in any situation that you would like uh, prayer for, or maybe you want to talk to somebody, we want to encourage you to reach out uh, to the Hebron office or to reach out to um, one of our elders here, um, to figure out maybe how we can help you or um, be a comfort to you at this time. I also want to encourage you to join our online fellowship groups that are happening after the service ends. Uh, to go to or to join one of those groups, go to the Hebron webpage, www.hebronchurch.ca. Go to the events section in the top uh, uh, menu bar and then click one of the online fellowship groups and choose the group that matches your answer to the preference question this week. It's at this time that I want to invite you to uh, rise and receive God's parting blessing as we leave this place. Or actually, you're not going anywhere, but <laughs> receive God's parting blessing.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Please join me as we sing, Praise the Father, Praise the Son. Sovereign God, O matchless King, the saints adore, the angels sing, and fall before the throne of grace. To you belong the highest praise. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit. Both in power and in grace, the name above all other names. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, yours is the glory forever. Peace.